probably Abhishek has not joined. So we'll start. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome you all uh, for today's webinar on behalf of uh, Department of PM and SP Nita in association with Odisha Association of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation as well as Indian Association of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation. I welcome you all for uh, today's webinar that's on uh, congenital anomalies of upper lip. Uh, this is a, a very vast subject. We'll, uh, we'll just go with an overview of what is congenital anomalies, brief your classification and causes, and some important congenital anomalies the upper limb, which are of uh, clinical importance. We'll discuss uh, those things. I don't know how far we'll cover within one hour. We'll try to cover it as much as possible. If we are not able to cover all the topics, probably we may have to take one more uh, webinar on completing this uh, series of uh, congenital anomalies of the upper limb. <clears throat> to start with, uh, let me share my let me share my screen. Is it audible to everybody? Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My, my slides are also visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. So, we'll go ahead with this uh, congenital anomalies of the upper limb. So, uh, uh, before going to that, let us discuss something about the development, how a upper limb uh, develops uh, normal process of development. So this upper limb develops from a upper limb bud, which appears around four weeks of fertilization or ovum. By the time mother knows about her pregnancy, by that time the limb buds already appear, and this limbs uh, rapidly develops in subsequent three weeks, and it is almost complete by eight weeks of interrupting life. And the typically the limb develops from proximal to distal. I repeat, it is from proximal to distal. And the type of anomaly depends upon at what age of the ovum the insult happened to the ovum. And accordingly, uh, the limb malformation develops. If it insult occurs in the early stages, then since the limb develops from proximal to distal, so the proximal part will be affected. If any insultation to the embryo occurs towards eight week of interrupting life, I mean towards completion of the limb, bar, that time the distal part will be affected like foot or hand. So this is how the limb bud develops. Uh, if you look to the historical backgrounds, it's known since uh, Stone Age. Uh, I mean, archaeologists they have found out uh, infant skeleton. Uh, they have studied and the earliest literature published in 19, uh, 1909 by Stockard. Uh, this is, I mean, the these kind of literatures are so old. And uh, they have found out that congenital anomaly various degree causes death about 23 percent. Subsequently, the 1968, 1997 onwards, so many literatures are publishing, and uh, various way of classification is trying to people trying to do. But till now, there is no standard classification for classifying the congenital anomalies. If you look to the etiology, 60 to 70 percent of all limb deficiencies are of unknown nature. There is no exact cause. There are so many hypotheses are there, but exact causes not known in case of 60 to 70 percent of limb deficiencies. However, there are a number of uh, etiological factors are there, like genetic factors, rounds in family. Many, many uh, congenital anomalies are from genetic in origin. Uh, then uh, the earlier uh, way of these drugs causes. Uh, animal, like thalidomide was taking uh, normally used for the hyperemesis gravidum in very uh, earlier ages. Now it is stopped. That was causing phocomelia. Tripton blue that was causing spina bifida. Vitamin A excess can give rise to anencephaly. And certain chemicals like lead nitrate can give rise to hydrocephalus or amenomelacin. So these are the drugs and chemicals which predisposes if it is exposed by the mother the chance of development of congenital anomalies. Other etiological factors like environmental factors 
constitutes 10 percent, maternal infection 3 percent, like torch infection, maternal other diseases 4 percent, uterine constraints 2 percent, drugs, chemical radiations around 1 percent, the rest of the things are on the origin. There are certain teratogenic agents which can uh, give rise to development of uh, anomalies, cyclophosphamide, deep penicillin, tetracycline, thalidomide, all of this cause alcohol, radiation, phenytoins, and uh, insulin. The Professor Duray Swami is an Indian uh, uh, researcher. Uh, he has studied in chick embryo by giving injection and found out that uh, there are several congenital anomalies are possible by injection of insulin also. So you can imagine that if the mother is taking, the mother is insulin dependent diabetes, mother to mellitus, he is likely to have also congenital anomaly baby. This etiology factors you all know, torch infection. This is standard uh, during the standard test for all antenatal checkup to prevent torch infection can give rise to cartilage, septal defects and others. X-ray radiation we all know also hazardous for uh, bone development, growing bone and also growing ovum has been seen be a factor for the cleft palate. Hypoxia like anemic conditions can give rise to anemic cephaly, spinal bifida, microcephaly that is possible for anemic mother. Intrauterine pressure, CTB, DDS, congenital knee dislocations are uh, so hypothesized that may be caused by increased intrauterine pressure. That's why the, this incidence is common in uh, priming gravidus. Uh, thermal exposure in post-conception phase has been found out that having relation with the development of congenital anomalies and certain RS in incompatibility may not be uh, its development, we can say, but uh, if there is incompatibility, there, there may be chorioarthritis or mental retardation because of this RS incompatibility. High doses of vitamin A, as I said, it can cause microcephaly and encephaly. And it has been seen that uh, use of multivitamin supplements can reduce the uh, limb incidence of limb deficiency. Now, coming to the nature of involvement, as I said, that uh, depends upon at what age uh, of the embryo the insult occurs. Accordingly, the, the malformations occur. This uh, type of malformation or the site of involvement may be preaxial or paraxial when the, or the upper limb radial border is affected post axial when the ulnar side is affected. It can be proximal, it can be distal, it can be whole. We will discuss during classification each one, paraxial, post axial, proximal, distal, and whole limb affection. So as I said, nature of the involvement depend upon the site and the extent of involvement depend upon the stage at which the insult occurs. As I said, if the insult occurs in the early stages, just during the development of limb bar, around four to six weeks, there will be complete arrest of development of limb. That leads to amelia or some form of hemimelia. But when the insult occurs to embryo towards late stage of development of limb bar, around eight weeks, there is a distal uh, reduction, that means hand reduction, finger reduction, or uh, brachydactyl, like that things. Here, the upper limb is twice as commonly affected than the lower limb. So more anomaly is in the upper limb. Now coming to the classification, there are several ways of classification for congenital anomalies, but none of classification is completely covering all varieties of classification. Why there is so, much, so many number of classification? Because none of the classification is complete. No classification can cover all types of congenital anomalies. That's why at different time, different researchers have tried to classify anomalies in different way. So these are outlines, way of classification, descriptive, embryological, etiological, morphogenic, these are all old types of classification. Descriptive varieties when you will describe the uh, anomaly, like uh, loss of finger, adductile, uh, arachnodactyly, limited number of absent of fever, club hand, club foot, polydactyly, cleft hand, lobster hand, they are just describing the part, or the affected part, or the anomalous part. So this is a descriptive way of uh, classifying anomalies. But in certain anomalies, you cannot describe. There, you cannot explain what type of anomaly. And this classification will not cover, uh, is not enough to cover all types of uh, uh, congenital anomalies. One is embryo, another is embryological classification that has been devised, uh, described by Hamilton et al. They have classified into, depending upon size, differentiation, and development. 
Size means if it is generalized, increase of size can be gigantism, or achondroplasia if it is reduced in size. Localized can be local gigantism or local hypoplasia. If there is a problem with differentiation, that we can get, you may get syndactyly, you may get absent digit, you may get absence of certain parts, maybe lack of differentiation of the uh, limb bird. So it can develop pseudoarthrosis also. And sometimes uh, either arrest or fusion or fail to differentiate. That also gives rise to different types of congenital anomaly. However, this classification system is also not enough to cover all anomalies. This is another classification, RS classification, uh, where again, this is some, this is one type of in a morphological classification. They have classified according to the uh, part present or absent and type of part. Then can be amelia as limbs fail to develop or remain as bored. Hemimelia, a segment of part is absent. Focomelia, a middle part or distal part is absent. Lobster claw hand, diceria, polydactyly, brachydactyly. So this is again one form of uh, like uh, morphological classification system. So this is another morphogenic by Swansa. This is uh, a lattice one means it has been further modified recently in 2015. Uh, Dr. Devakar was asking me about the OMT classification of the congenital animal. It's a lattice one published in uh, Tajian's uh, Pediatrics Orthopedics book. That is, uh, is that, that OMT classification is the extension of this Swanson's classification. Uh, the OMT means it's, uh, the three authors, Oberg, Michael, and Tonkin. Uh, these three authors, they describe a classification system uh, into different way, like malformations, deformations, and dysplasias. They cover almost all types of uh, congenital anomalies. But however, it's a very big list to remember, but this is a classification currently uh, published in 2015. And this that classification is the extension of uh, this Swanson's classification system. So this Swanson's classification uh, is next is the modified OMT classification, and also uh, French oralis classification or ISPO classification. All these classifications are arising from this Swanson's uh, classification system. Swanson's also they classified into uh, failure of formation part by transverse deficiency or intracular deficiency. We'll discuss in, in a pictorial form, for, you'll better understand that. Then failure of differentiation part, duplications, overgrowth, undergrowth, congenital constriction band syndrome, generalized skeletal abnormalities. So this is a Swanson is the, is the baseline classification for all modern transmission system. These are a few pictures of the congenital constriction band syndrome, local gigantism, uh, terminal transverse deficiency, longitudinal deficiency. We'll discuss in detail uh, uh, in uh, the French oralis classification. This is a French oralis classification the, you can say the uh, one of the uh, classifications which covers maximum number of congenital anomalies. Like we uh, discuss our splint classification system, a wrist hand, uh, uh, hand wrist elbow, hand wrist forearm, or uh, wrist forearm elbow. Like that classification system, we have biological uh, name for the uh, animals and plants. Similarly, this is a classification system which almost cover almost. Uh, most of the uh, congenital anomalies. And this is the again base uh, platform of classification of, of ISPO classification. Okay, so the ISPO classification also originating from this French oralis classification. This French oralis classification broadly classified anomalies into terminal and into, please try to understand this is the uh, fundamental of all uh, congenital anomaly classification. So this French oralis classification classify anomalies into terminal and intercalary. Terminal means beyond that anomaly, nothing, nothing is existing. Intercalary means in between. The in between part is absent, but distal part is present. The terminal part is present. So terminal and intercalary. Again, terminal can be classified into transverse and longitudinal. Terminal, if you look to this picture, this is a terminal. There's no part existing beyond this term. So this is a terminal variety of uh, congenital anomaly uh, of the upper limb. So this terminal can be transverse. That means the limb is cut like thing, transversely cut. 
So all congenital amputity amputees are coming under terminal transverse uh, uh, varieties. So terminal transverse deficiency through forearm that indicates it is a below elbow amputation, congenital below elbow amputation. Terminal transverse deficiency of the humerus that indicates it is a trans congenital trans humeral amputee. So this is a terminal transverse deficiency. Okay. Then terminal longitudinal deficiency. If you look to this limb, this is a uh, example of a uh, terminal longitudinal deficiency. Why? Here maybe it is not clearly visible. This is a case of fibular hemimelia with the absence of fourth and fifth toe. So why it is longitudinal? Because a longitudinal bone is absent. That means the fibula is absent with corresponding foot ridge also absent. So terminally nothing is there. It is longitudinal and terminal. Clear? So a fibular hemimelia with absence of lateral ridge of the foot are the terminal longitudinal deficiency. A congenital amputee is a terminal transverse deficiency. Okay. So coming to the next varieties, uh, terminal intercolor deficiency. Intercolor again, intercolor transverse and intercolor longitudinal. What is intercolor transverse? If you look to this picture, transverse means this is cut. So in between portion is transversely absent. So these are all focomelias group. Maybe proximal focomelia, maybe distal focomelia, but all focomelia will come under intercolory transverse division. Why it is intercolory? Because the terminal hand is there. So the hand is present here. So intercolor in between part is absent. So maybe here the arm is absent, the forearm is uh, the forearm is absent, the arm, hand is directly attached to the arm. So this is a variety of intercolory transverse deficiency. So what is intercolor longitudinal deficiency? If you look to this picture, if it is a case of hemimelia, tubular hemimelia, with the presence of the normal foot. So this comes under a intercolor longitudinal deficiency. Why not is it transverse uh, terminal? Because the terminal foot is normal. So it is a longitudinal because whole length of fibula is absent. That's why it is intercolor longitudinal deficiency. I hope it is clear uh, to all of you. This is the simplest way of classifying a uh, limb deficiency. This is a, again a pictorial diagram. You can uh, look to this picture. So this is a terminal transverse deficiency, transverse terminal deficiency, terminal and transverse. This is terminal longitudinal deficiency. The fibula is absent and the fifth toe is absent. This is intercolor picture where the in-between part of the forearm is absent and transversely absent, because both, both the bones are absent. The hand is directly attached to the forearm arm. So this is uh, transverse intercolor deficiency and intercolor longitudinal deficiency where the only longitudinal fibula is absent, but the distal part, the fifth toe is present. Okay, so this is a pictorial diagram of a terminal and intercolor deficiency again divided into transverse and longitudinal type. Coming to some examples of terminal deficiencies. So, amelia, where the complete absence of the limb or congenital amputies, archery, archery or apodia, foot absence or hand absence, adactylia, finger absent, alphalangia. So, these are all uh, transverse deficiency already uh, described this picture. The longitudinal deficiency already explained hemimelias, uh, complete hemimelia or incomplete hemimelia. Intercolor deficiency already explained to you that in case of intercolor transverse deficiency or complete focomelia where the hand or foot is directly attached to the trunk. That means the arm and forearm both are absent. Then other varieties are proximal focomelia, this is complete focomelia, then proximal focomelia or distal focomelia. Proximal focomelia where the arm or thigh is absent, the hand or foot along with the leg and forearm is directly attached to the trunk. Distal focomelia 
Because the hand is there, arm is there, but forearm is absent. That means the hand is directly attached to the arm. That is distal coconut. Distal part is a transversal absent. Then intercalar longitudinal, these are all hemimelias, tibial hemimelia, fibular hemimelia, whether uh, must, but the provided the distal part must be present. The thumb must be present for the radial club hand or uh, the for fibula fifth row must be present. For tibial hemimelia, the great toe must be present. Then it will, it will come under intercalary longitudinal deficiency. This is ISPO classification, wrongly written in ISO. This is ISPO classification. The same is just a extension of fringe oralis classification. So terminal, these are already, we have explained this. These are some of the pictures. Terminal, transverse deficiency. Now, uh, coming to the principle of treatment. Or uh, this type of a terminal transverse deficiency is first we'll discuss. That is your congenital amputation. So uh, one can choose for any reconstructive surgery if at all is possible. Any ablative surgery with the distal rudimentary part is burden for the patient or causing problem in fitting the socket. You may go for ablative surgery or directly you can go for a prosthetic fitting if it is a congenital amputation. Or you may prescribe adoptive devices along with that. And parent counsel is important because how long the child will accept the prosthesis is also possible. So coming to Amelia, where one or both limbs are completely absent. But surprisingly, these people have a remarkable power of adaptation. They use their lower limb for certain activities. They have a strong proprioceptive perception. They can use their uh, foot as hand, they can eat, they can hold a spoon, they have a wide, wide flexibility in the process of development, they use their uh, lower limb as upper limb function. So what is our role? We will try to encourage the use of the lower limb for independent ideal activities. So more and more gymnastic, gymnastic type of exercises are encouraged to increase mobility of the spine and hip and uh, the prehensile ability of the two foot and toes for feeding, dressing, and writing must be increased. You might have seen uh, in WhatsApp and other videos are also, you might have seen the this upper limb amputees, bilateral, they are using the lower limb, foot as hand, they can write, they can hold a uh, spoon. And uh, when there is small digits or rudimentary parts, that should be maintained. But sometimes these rudimentary parts helps in operating the power uh, prosthesis we are using. So rudimentary part is try, always try to preserve unless otherwise it is causing problem in socket fitting. So different types of prosthesis can be used. I don't want to go in detail about this. We'll discuss more about the congenital anomalies. So uh, this is about congenital amputees, whether uh, forearm or hand. And these amputees, uh, they a little bit differ from traumatic amputees of uh, pediatric age group. In a case of pediatric age group, with the traumatic amputation is there, they, are, they have a high tendency of bone growth. Every time they will have a terminal bone growth will cause repeated ulceration, which is problem in prosthetic fitting. Whereas this problem is not seen in case of uh, congenital amputees. So this uh, terminal bone growth is not so complicated or no, it's not so severe in congenital amputees. So the question arises whether to go straight away for prosthetic fitting or a surgery. So the, as I said that they have a remarkable power adaptation. So one must first evaluate the congenital amputees, what is their uh, level of functional activities. Okay, because they have a high uh, capacity of adaptability. Okay, say so they can use their uh, lower limb as hand function. So before advising any prosthesis, otherwise if you just uh, forcefully give a prosthesis to him, he may just uh, uh, hand the prosthesis on his bedside, he will not use it. Uh, there are so many examples are there also. And so pictures the people are with bilateral amputees, upper limb amputees, they can do the normal day-to-day -day activity without any prosthesis. 
Uh, upper limb prosthesis, custody appearance to have like is normal limb that motivate the child for aging prosthesis. So even the small child also, uh, we should uh, prescribe a prosthesis because that helps in bimanual activities of the child, that overall growth, crawling, standing, walking, taking help of uh, uh, working, all these things required a uh, passive hand at least. So prosthesis can be prescribed at any age once the child started sitting or standing uh, should be prescribed. So the same question, the, what is the time of fitting a prosthesis for a uh, child? This is a child uh, reported to our institute with uh, congenital, you can see uh, transverse deficiency, transverse terminal deficiency of the left upper limb, also same on the left lower limb also. The child was fitted with uh, a bilalba prosthesis and a um, Evapne prosthesis, you can see the suspension system is from his uh, shoulder. So uh, uh, the child, the prosthesis can be fitted as early as five to seven month age, just to uh, facilitate his uh, milestones. So initially they are just passive prosthesis. As the child started understanding the commands, then different types of terminal devices can be tried. So at six to eight months, prosthesis is fitted to encourage the crawling and to hunt play. To hunt play must be increased. And the sensitivity, sensibility of the end of the stomp is utilized for provision of the end uh, open-ended prosthesis. So preferably open-ended sockets should be uh, prescribed in pediatric age group to maintain the sensibility of the stomp. Transhumeral prosthesis as early as two years uh, can be fitted, but as soon as the child started learning about the terminal devices, afterwards the myelectric prosthesis can be prescribed. But the problem is the length. If you can see that this is a child with a transhumeral, but the prosthesis length is almost uh, because he has a uh, proximal femoral deficiency also. So the prosthesis length is quite bigger. This is case with the transhumeral with a uh, uh, this uh, congenital uh, amelia of the right lower limb. In case of bilateral uh, types of uh, amputees, uh, preferably Krokenberg procedure is preferable at least on one side, especially when the vision is a problem, associated vision problem is there, it's better to go for a one side Krokenberg procedure and other side normal process. This is transverse terminal deficiency of all four limbs. So what type of prosthesis depend upon the, uh, the child's adaptability and how far he can operate the prosthesis according to the design should be done. But uh, as I said that upper limb prosthesis are not well tolerated because they, these are heavy and bit complicated. So many times it is used as a passive purpose for bimanual activities or some cosme or sometimes cosmetic purpose also. So one should look for patient psychology and acceptance about the prosthesis and uh, the post counseling and behavioral modification is required after prescribing prosthesis. Uh, adult upper limb amputees have a poor acceptance. If the child, the, the patient is a congenital amputee, if you prescribe them a prosthesis in adult age group, well, they will not accept it. So if you look to this picture, this is a uh, amputee also he, he, where he can do all his activities without a prosthesis. So before prescribing prosthesis, please look, uh, look into the, what are the requirement of the patient. Just prescribing prosthesis is not good enough. You have to assess his, uh, assess his activities daily living, his functional capability, what external prosthesis is required, then accordingly prosthesis should be prescribed. Now coming to hemimelia group of uh, deficiencies where there is a complete absence of one bone with corresponding digits. These are all longitudinal terminal deficiencies or uh, uh, otherwise called incomplete paraxial, paraxial hemimelia. Then uh, when there, is, there may be associated with the complete absence or presence of the distal part. Accordingly, whether it is a longitudinal terminal or it is a longitudinal intercolor. This is varieties of uh, terminal deficiency. You can see the fingers are absent, left hand.
intracolor deficiency as i said mostly uh, if it is transverse phocomelia can be proximal phocomelia where the proximal part is absent forearm is forearm and hand is directly attached to the trunk or distal phocomelia where the hand is directly attached to the arm is a proximal phocomelia distal phocomelia but when the part is very small the treatment should be as phocomelia as in phocomelia the the rudimentary there is small rudimentary or top top uh, soft tissue only attached to the trunk that is complete phocomelia a similarly in case of this distal phocomelia or the proximal phocomelia depending upon the functional ability of the rudimentary part if it is non functional better to amputate and fix with a good prosthesis if it little bit function is there better to preserve it so that uh, he can use the rudimentary hand for uh, holding or other things or else this can be utilized for operation of the a my electric variable prosthesis now uh, this is all about different classification system different types of uh, congenital anomalies now we'll discuss some of the uh, important congenital anomalies of clinical importance uh the most common congenital anomalies the upper limb we come across in our clinical practice are radial claw hand ulnar claw hand is very uncommon very less uh then radiolar synostosis then uh, sprenzel uh, shoulder then uh, your uh, uh one form of uh, distal radiolar problem we'll discuss in detail about that so let us start with radial claw hand this is one of the common congenital anomalies the, of the upper limb otherwise called paraxial radial hemimelia or radial neuromelia if you look to the picture of a uh, radial claw hand where the radius is either completely absent or partially absent so the clinical picture we see the radius is absent so the hand will be deviated towards the uh, radial side and no radial support and all the uh, muscles attached to the radius are, are either absent or fibrotic in nature or underdeveloped and the bones related to the radius like distally related to scaphoid or trapezius they may be absent or hypoplastic in nature proximally also the scapula clavicle and humerus may be reduced in size when radius is not there the long long head of bicep is frequently absent because there is no function of bicep and all the muscles are originating from the radius lateral radius isl isrb pronator teres then pronator uh, palmaris longus pronator quadratus epl apl apl all are originating from the radius and all are either absent or fibrotic in nature so you just you can imagine that just correcting the deformity is not sufficient enough so these are the muscles which are really helpful for function of the hand are either absent or fibrotic in nature median nerve is typically thickened and it looks like a tendon when we are trying to correct it sometimes it's misdiagnosed as a tendon so one must be very much careful during the correction of the radial claw hand uh, at least about the identification of median nerve radial artery sometimes absent or hypoplastic in nature again that say uh, serious situation radial artery is absent and you are operating or centralizing the the uh, radius if you by chance you injured the ulnar artery so you are like to develop a vascular insufficiency typically the forearm is short thin hand is radially deviated and ulna is thick stout and broad if you look to this picture the hand is small hand is deviated radially typically the thumb is absent here and uh, the forearm is short if you look to this picture there is a partial deficiency of the radius and ulna is longer stouter broad or curved okay so these are the typical pictures of the radial claw hand so more neglected radial claw hands presenting in late age so either radius is completely absent or partially absent so what is the treatment for radial claw hand uh, conservative includes casting and splinting when the child present in early age less than 6 month or 2 month 3 month as soon as the child 
Then the parent noticed that uh, the one hand is very small, uh, thumb may be absent or present or absent. They report to you for management. So initially our aim is to uh, correct the deformity by serial casting. As you know, all congenital anomalies, wherever the deformities are there, we nearly just we try to correct the deformity by uh, serial casting that helps in stretching the contracted structures, that helps in correcting the deformity and maybe if the deformity is not fully corrected, the requirement of surgery, the extension of the surgery may be less. So all sort of congenital anomalies uh, presenting with the deformity must be tried with some form of uh, serial casting that helps in some extent correction of deformity. So this congenital treatment when the child is presenting less than one year is, is so we'll try to correct the deformity, stretch the radial contracted structures and other uh, indications of the conservative management are uh, anomaly incompatible with life. So these are sometimes associated with Vector syndrome, vertebral anomaly, anal atresia, the cardiac defect. These are the some of the associated anomalies which are incompatible with life. That's why those patient children should not undergo surgery. The inadequate elbow flexor. The radius is not there. Maybe the, the bicep muscles are, is no longer, the bicep is not there. So the, the child will not have uh, adequate active elbow flexion there. The surgery is only just a cosmetic uh, correction, but since the elbow flexion is not there, so the, it's better to go manage conservative method. And the last one is older patient. The child is reported, the patient reported very uh, elderly age group, say 30 years, 40 years, uh, 25, 30 years. The person, uh, with deformity has already adapted with, with that deformity to all his activities. So very often they don't like to go for surgery or else if you do surgery also still uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, for correction. So better to avoid surgery in this latest group. If you plan operative treatment, you operate or you refer to your friends for surgery, so the ideal age is beyond six months. So uh, sometimes we, the, if the hand is not uh, well grown and uh, you don't have a sizable ulna, sometimes you wait for a few more days to get a sizable ulna for uh, centralization of the corpus. And uh, uh, there are also another problem. It is not only with the deformity, the thumb is absent or it is hyperplastic or it is non-functional. So adequate care should be taken for correction of the thumb that is normally done at 9 to 12 months. Uh, it's done as a second stage. First stage is correction of deformity. Second stage is functional thumb by polycization. So what are the procedures done for this uh, deformity correction? Release of the contractures on the radial side. As I said, the radial side is contracted. The central, centralize the ulna to the middle of the carpus, special to the lunate bone. The lunate bone is taken out, a notch is created there, and the distal end of the ulna is uh, centered into that notch. That is called centralization of the uh, ulna. Thumb reconstruction, if it is hypoplastic, or if there is uh, no thumb bilaterally, then one can go for two transfer also. Uh, when there is a, a elbow flexion is not there, then tricep can be, since bicep is absent, then tricep can be transferred uh, to the entrance for the elbow to have elbow flexion. These are some steps. If the child is presenting a late age and child has not undergone any serial casting, then first stage will be to go for stretching of the radial structures so that the radial side, all contractor structures will be stretched. That helps in centralization of ulna. We'll take out the lunate here and we'll put the distal ulna to the lunate notch. And if the curve of the ulna is more than 30 degree, then that requires osteotomy here to make the ulna straight and the distal ulna will be put into the uh, notch of the lunate. So by that, you can neutralize the position of the wrist and correct the angulation of the forearm. This step can be ignored if the child has undergone, already undergone, uh, serial casting. I think this is beyond the scope of our discussion. Uh, the surgical principles, the principle I have already explained that we have to create a nose in the lunate 
and ulna has to fix to the notch and to make it more functional sometimes the flexor carpi ulna is is transfer or advance to ecu to correct the radial deviation so the hand is radial deviated you have to shorten the ulna side so that the it helps in uh, maintaining the correction of the neutral position of the wrist as i said ulna rostotomy may be required if the angle is more than 30 degree and uh, in, in case of bilateral cases of radial club hand the one hand should be in 45 degree of supination and other hand should be 45 degree of pronation this is about the case manage by a distractor application then subsequently by centralization of ulna but there are complications to this uh, congenital uh, radial absence radial club hand when you displace the ulna sometimes we have to excite the distal ulna so there is chance of growth arrest to the ulna there will be ankylosis of the wrist which helps which causes problem in wrist movement painful wrist recurrent instability of the wrist joint damage to medial nerve as i said the medial nerve is very thick here that confuses with the flexor tendon so the it should be identified properly uh, during the surgical procedure vascular insufficiency complication as many times the radial artery is hypoplastic the hand is surviving in the ulnar artery so uh, one must be careful for that infection necrosis is a big flap has to be done, taken for centralization so sometimes we encounter infections and necrosis polycization yes when the centralization helps in this is just the cosmetic correction for uh, making a functional hand the thumb must be uh, functional so that needs a polycization procedure where the index is met to thumb index is rotated 160 degree test first 40, 40 degree of the palmar abduction that uh, the index will work like a thumb and uh, the uh, when the thumb the index is absent also the toe can be transferred to the hand that is a uh, free transplant procedure requires help of uh, vascular surgeon this is a case where polycization has been done index has been met to thumb so to make the thumb more functional the next procedure is the opponents plasty after making the index as thumb to make it functional opponents plasty is required where the abductor digiti minimi uh, of the lateral finger is transferred to the lateral band of the lateral band and central slip of the plp joint of the transferred index finger that is opponents plasty bicep transfer when there is inadequate elbow flexion that is a contraindication of surgery but if tricep is functional there is a rudimentary proximal radius one can transfer tricep to and transfer to anterior elbow flexion the next anomaly is congenital absence of ulna very uncommon anomaly one in one lakh live birth uh, present so that's not so common here the ulna is absent radius is there uh, so the function depends upon the if the ulna is absent proximal complete absence of ulna or the distal absence of ulna the distal absence of ulna are very good results with the proximal ulna really forms the elbow joint so we keep the proximal ulna if it is there then we bridge the existing radius to the uh, ulna that is called ulnarization of the radius so that is a procedure also there are beautiful results with that so in that situation our principle will be on uh, retaining function and also cosmesis that is deformity correction the next anomaly is congenital radioulnar synostosis the next common congenital anomaly of the upper limb very often we encounter in our clinical practice in opd many cases with congenital uh, radioulnar synostosis this is a congenital disorder affecting superradioulnar joint typically it affect the superradial nerve joint uh, because the limb develops from a, uh, a single limb board from a single cartilage insert rod which differentiate in radius ulna and the differentiation occurs from distal to proximal so that's why the radial ulnar synostosis is mostly seen in the 
proximal radial nerve joint. Okay, and in that situation, the hand will be fixed in a definite position. Whether it is fixed in pronation or supination or mid prone position, but it will be fixed in one position. So the the child cannot do supination or pronation. And the etiologically, as I said, the forearm develops from a single cartilage unless. that divides from distal to proximal and the division is complete by seventh inter week of intertwin life the whole limb develops by eighth week radius of the division of course complete by seventh week <clears throat> any failure of differentiation between these radius and ulna from distal to proximal leads to a uh, remnant at the proximal radial ulna area that fail to differentiate proximally uh, with a cartilaginous mass or synostosis the males are more affected than female 3 to 1 60% cases of radial ulnar synostosis are bilateral and 20% out of them are 20% having positive family history okay so most positional and functional tasks can be achieved with a, they 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 can do the normal act they not they don't present early they present late as Because they can do all his activities by utilizing the shoulder. Okay, so most positional functional activities can be achieved with a rotation arc of 100 degree, 50 degree supination to 50 degree pronation. If they are within that uh, range, then they don't seek uh, any treatment. If the that range is not there, definitely they present with some sort of limitation in their hand function, and they are difficult in eating, difficult in combing, difficult in other uh, cleaning, other ideal activities. they are you have to do intervene in between so they are uh, you will find radial asymmetry four arms are fixed in one position either supination or pronation in uh, in a particular position or, or mid prone position the affected four arm is thinner twisted appearance why because supination pronation is not there so pronator arteries supinators all these muscles which are who are responsible for supination pronation all are absent or fibrotic in nature so what will happen the forearm will appear like a cylindrical forearm and twisted in appearance there is limitation of the forearm movements and that movements will be compensated by shoulder joint movements when the child will eat with uh, the supination of hand by rotating at the shoulder level but they have a normal wrist function extension of elbow sometimes limited if it is the synostosis is more proximal radial head is either absent ill formed mal formed or dislocated backward or forward anything is possible so how do they manage this radial synostosis patient they the shoulder abduction that compensates loss of active pronation the active pronation will be compensated by shoulder abducts abduction they eat like this it is prone to hand they eat like this they bring their hand in prone position to the mouth by abducting the shoulder they compensate their loss of active supination by adducting the shoulder they eat like this they adduct the shoulder by eat like this okay they have a wrist hypermobility with uh, with time because they mostly they hyper flex the wrist or hyper extend the wrist for eating purpose elbow flexion is usually prevalent but sometimes elbow flexion deformity is there the average position is around 30 degree of pronation as commonly said this is a old classification of classifying radial ulnar synostosis the type 1 is the radius ulna is completely fused proximally if you look to this picture the both the radius and ulna has a common medullary canal the radial canal is continuous with the ulnar canal okay so the radius appear as if the radius is growing from the ulna it is usually bilateral in 80% cases type 2 there is a congenital dislocation of ill formed radial head this is not a true synostosis okay they are just the radius ulnar anchored at the level of coronoid process It's not a true synostosis. Radius is thick and stouter than the ulna, so you will not get much uh, X-ray findings here, except that there is a severe restriction of supination and pronation, and there is some uh, sclerotic changes 
and the uh, coronal process of the organ. That gives you suspicious of a case of type 2 uh, congenital uh, radial nerve synestrosis. Type 3, the head of the radius is present. Again, it is malform. The upper part of the shaft is fused with the upper part of the ulna. So the uh, synestrosis is more distal beyond the coronal process. Okay, they are sometimes confused with uh, pulled elbow. So this is the current classification system. It is completely different, the old, different from the old classification system. Type 1 is no osseous synestrosis, where in earlier classification, type 1 is a complete synestrosis. Here, the type 1 is no osseous synestrosis. Radial head is reduced. Type 2 is osseous synestrosis. Radial head is reduced. Type 3 is long osseous synestrosis. Radial head hypoplastic or posteriorly dislocated. Type 4, osseous synestrosis with radial head mushroom shape and dislocated anterally. So, type 4, anterior dislocation. Type 3, posterior dislocation. Type 2, only osseous uh, synestrosis. Radial head is reduced. For type 1, no synestrosis, but radial head is reduced in size. So, this is the current form of classification system. Now, coming to management, how do you manage those cases of uh, radial nerve synestrosis? So, you have to be very tricky and clinically must be very sound, must be judicious about the treatment. So this is a hand which is normally functioning. They are adapted to their uh, limitation of supination progression. So you have to exactly look for what are the limitations of the radial, how far they are affecting their normal day to day life. Accordingly, you have to plan. So conservative management, which you prescribe are low demand patients, forearm fixed in functional position. Suppose the forearm fixed in mid prone position. No, you don't need any treatment. They can manage with this. Okay. Asymptomatic and unilateral cases. Unilateral cases, the uh, if it is right hand uh, uh, synestrosis, the patient can be encouraged to use his left hand for most of his radial activities. So maybe uh, the requirement of surgery is uh, minimal. So uh, really, in case of unilateral asymptomatic cases, also give a second thought for correcting it. And the last one is unwilling to accept the risk of surgery. And there are certain risks like compartment syndrome is possible. Due. Uh, reposition of ostotomy. So, after explaining everything to the, the parents, if they are not ready, it's better to go for conservative management. Conservative management means you have to encourage shoulder and associated movements for their radial activities. Operative treatment, uh, the absolute indications are significant limitation of radial, that includes eating, hygiene, sports, coming and uh, personal hygiene that uh, is, uh, uh, these are all absolute indications of surgery. Relative indication includes severe proneness and deformity of more than 60 degree and bilateral environment. So uh, that these are relative indications and the procedures uh, for uh, correcting this or solving the problem of the synestrosis patient is by mobilization or repositioning of the Mobilization means Mobilize the site of synastrosis. Repositional means reposition of the forearm in a functional position. So different methods of mobilization, excise the synastrosis and interpose some vascularized fascio fat graft. But still, it's not sufficient. Other methods are interposed anchorous muscle in that area, uh, or do the ostotomy at the synastrosis, expose that area, wide apart it, put either some uh, vascular fat or uh, some uh, vascular fat also, non-vascular fat or anchorless muscles nearby, you can put muscle into the uh, ostotomy site. Excision alone without graft intervention, just excise the graft, but the results are always un unsatisfactory. The reason behind is that though, though there is synostosis, but it is not the problem is not confined to the bone only. There are other parts are also affected like Intercess membrane is very thick, very thick and fibrotic in nature. Even if exercise completes the synestrosis area, still there is unlikely that the person will develop full supinational progression. It's because the thick intercess membrane. The second is the muscles responsible for supinational progression, like pronator teres, pronator quadratus, supinators. All these muscles are fibrotic in nature, developmental fibrotic in nature, developmental hypoplastic in nature. So they will they are not working. That's why even after excision also. 
unlikely you will get full uh, uh, range of pronation supination so all these methods have a guided uh, prognosis so these are limitations attempt to excite the bony bridge often fail because of poorly developed muscles complete freeing of radius is not justified osteotomy the forearm bones to better functional person will be tried that is repositional osteotomy and always always explain the patient that the the, the prognosis is guided we are just repositioning the hand in a functional person don't expect any pronation supination movements we are just facilitating your adl by repositioning the forearm hand in a better functional position so always always explain counsel the patient before attempting any surgical correction so procedure at, uh, attempted as i said uh, resection of synostosis resecting radius and interposing fasciata already explained and some people uh, like in type 3 and type 4 variety of radial synostosis where the radius is displaced anterior or posteriorly they have tried by putting fasciata as anchor to prevent uh, displacing the radius but still the results are not encouraging pronator teres rerouting can be done if the pronator teres muscle is there power is there function is there you, you see in operating side that the muscle is well functional muscle is well built you can try for rerouting provided you have to have done a good synostosis excision the most accepted procedure is the derotational osteotomy we do derotational osteotomy in our hospital also that we find the best way of managing synostosis but thing is that you have to how best you are choosing the right patient for surgery that is more important so here we repose the forearm in a reposition the forearm in a more functional resting position normally age around 3 to 6 year age group are best age for considering surgery so here we have to either uh, do osteotomy only radius or radius and ulna both we in our center prefer both radius and ulna uh, osteotomy so there are th three levels of osteotomy is possible either you can osteotomize both radius and ulna proximal to the diaphysis at the, uh, the synostosis site or distal to the synostosis site we prefer always distal to the synostosis site and or only uh, radial uh, osteotomy to make it a non unilateral to help in supination of progression so the best preferred procedure for us is is a both osteotomy both radius and ulna ulna proximally and radius distally and uh, the uh, osteotomy site is distal to the synostosis then once you do osteotomy whether there are lot of uh, research or lot of surgeons uh, doctors they have different opinion some people prefer to correct at the site of osteotomy do osteotomy proximally ulna distally radius on the table itself uh, reposition the limb to a functional position as you desire this is one way second way just do osteotomy leave it as such call the patient after 10 to 2 weeks during stitch removal under general anesthesia you just rotate it the advantage of this uh, the rotation in late age around 10 to 2 2 weeks time is that you can prevent displacement of the uh, both the bones on the osteotomy side because by the 2 weeks time the small child there is possibility of development of adequate amount of soft callus which prevents the osteotomy bone displaced further so uh, uh, preferably if you are not putting an implant for stabilization of the osteotomy sites uh, you can go for uh, delayed correction that means you will just uh, do the osteotomy leave it as such with a slab call the person at 3 weeks do your 10 10 to 2 weeks 10 days to 2 weeks then take out the stitch at that time reposition in the functional position and third variety is gradual correction of the circular extension etc laser up but that not that is not so popular because laser up is not so popular for the upper limb functions So what is the position at which position one should fix? If it is a unilateral uh, uh, the condition, the radial or synostosis, and you are doing a double level osteotomy, one proximal ulna and distal radius, there uh, you can keep the forearm in zero to thirty degree of position. 
why if it is right hand especially if you are uh, doing full supination then the child will have difficulty in writing so do the things you need supination for writing you need uh, pronunciation for writing so you have to keep in in between position so at around 0 to 30 degree of pronunciation that helps in uh, both eating and writing purpose if it is a bilateral synostosis you are correctly bilaterally fix the dominant forearm in 0 to 15 degree of position pronunciation and the non dominant position for a in a neutral or mid prone position that is preferably uh, for a bilateral involvement there are a lot of complications to the uh, this uh, synostosis correction also the most important is the uh, recurrence of malnutrition even with the best effort if you are not putting any uh, implants there is possibility that there is further 15 to 20 degree loss of correction so you have to be a little bit judicious to go for a little bit over correction you will expect some amount of reverse deformity so if you are doing uh, 20 degree of uh, supination it may come back to a mid prone position so better to do some amount of over correction compartment syndrome is sometimes is complication so that's why don't uh, put any cast if you are putting cast make it a loose cast or better to go for a bival cast or a simple slab because you are the, your peristom is intact you have just do osteotomy so uh, you can prevent compartment syndrome that way yes neurological deficits are sometimes uh, possible if you are doing osteotomy proximal to the synostosis because the the pin is close to the radial neck so when you do a osteotomy proximal to the synostosis you are likely to injure a uh, pin postentesis nerve you have to isolate that or uh, do in full prone position so that you are the postentesis nerve is far away now so it's better to go for below syndesmosis so there are less uh, likely to injure any nerve this is a uh, procedure a uh, case of radial synostosis so initially you have to take mark the site of uh, osteotomy that is distal to the synostosis by through image intensifier we have marked it with a very small incision around 2 cm or 1/2 cm incision just the expose the ulna which is very superficial on the posterior aspect do multiple drill holes and do a precise osteotomy if there is it is the osteotomy site is displacing you can put a simple nail or simple caver to get a rotational stability here and then we mark the uh, osteotomy of the distal radius or the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction this is the distal radius osteotomy site then expose the radius on the with a, uh, again a small incision within 2 cm then we did a osteotomy here then gradual gradual supinate then measure how much of supination you have achieved by holding the object on the first wave space uh, the way we measure supination pronation then see the keep the uh, rotate the forearm in a desired position of functional position keep in that position and go for uh, plaster slab or cast as per your choice so i think uh, it's 8:30 we so will stop here Uh, the rest of the impossible the other two congenital anomalies mm. will discuss in the subsequent mm. now the uh, discussion is open for uh, question answer any doubt uh, please you can put your question in the chat box ravi se ka join he can take up your question and ask ravi se ki var muted i think uh, on mute is him facing some technical uh, problems i think i'm am i audible now sir yes yes you are audible now okay so uh, hello am yes, i yes, audible yes yes you are audible okay so first before going out sir i i would like to because the initial part of the discussion you said that about the prosthesis part in uh, cases of focomolia sir how you specially uh, choose like can you give some guideline to the viewers like how we choose about the uh, distal prosthesis distal part of the pro- prosthesis like what type of the devices you prefer as i said that this focomolia has especially been it is a 
distal pocomilla, proximal pocomilla, they have a rudimentary hand. So uh, the prosthesis, if the, the part is very, I mean, this sizable arm, arm and forearm is there, no prosthesis is required. They normally have a functional hand. If they really it is a focomelia, a rudimentary uh, hand, or it is a small top top uh, only uh, soft tissues are there, the process is the, the, the shoulder disarticulation type of process prescribed there. And uh, this rudimentary part, if this little bit function is there, if the patient can afford better to go for a uh, power process also that helps uh, the rudimentary part, helps in switch on of the power and helps in power process treatment. Uh, basically in uh, sectors where that power process is not available, shoulder disarticulation type of process is prescribed. Hello. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, is it uh, clear? Yeah. 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 It's quite clear, sir. Uh, I request the participants, like, uh, they can put their questions uh, in the chat box so, the, so that it becomes uh, very easy uh, and I can ask the questions uh, to others. So, also, uh, I would like to know, sir. Uh, uh, what is your experience like? Wh how uh, can you give us just an overview? Like you have a vast experience, so can you tell us uh, how? What is your long term uh, in uh, in general? What is your long, uh, how you see the outcome? Like suppose we are counseling a patient for a uh, uh, congenital deformity. So how you counsel? Because you have seen the pa patients maybe for more than ten to fifteen years. Many patients you have seen, but those who are beginners or the new uh, consultants. They can you can just throw a light like how you counsel for long term outcome of the uh, congenital anomalies. So it depends upon what type of anomaly you are dealing. But especially when you deal with the uh, in our part, if you look for conservative management, then like any uh, hemimelias or any uh, transverse or terminal deficit like amputees, uh, they are uh, the I'll uh, suggest for the business don't throw processes on the on the patient. Just look that what is the exact uh, requirement of the patient, what is the functional ability of the patient, and what uh, what uh, how you are solving the problem. Just prescribing process is not good enough. Well, you will just hang the process on the side of his bed. So you have to see what are the existing functional ability of the person with the deformities or the disability or the amputation. Then accordingly, the process should be prescribed. And certain other congenital anomalies like uh, uh, for a beginner, when you are getting a patient, you should have a brief knowledge about the congenital anomalies and what is going to happen in the future. If you are not intervening the patient from the beginning stage, what complications the parents are likely to face? These things must be counseled to the patient. And what procedure, whether you are going to manage conservative or surgical procedure. If you are managing conservative, what are the limitations? How best they can use the, the prosthesis or the aids and appliances? This is the first part a beginner or a uh, physiologist must uh, take care of these things. I think you have answered the next question also. The a question has been asked in chat box that, uh, like, what is the outcome of surgery we should expect, whether it is a functional or it is at the level of ADL or it's just a cosmetic? Uh, I think this question is asked in, in terms of the main three deformities being explained in this discussion. So maybe, sorry, over to you, sir. Uh, I don't actually, I'm not getting it, whether it is for the Synostosis or radial club hand or both? Uh, yeah, that has not been. Uh, okay, question, okay. If, if we, can, we can use the question for the both the purpose also. The cosmetic yeah. as well as radial activity, yes. For the radial or synostosis, cosmetic is not a big problem because the only the forearm is a bit cylindrical and set. Uh, otherwise, cosmetic cosmetic is not a problem. But only radial activities uh, is a problem, as I said. That if the for the four average fixed in mid prone position or, or 20 plus minus 20 degree, then uh, it is unilateral, better to leave it as such and just see exactly see the how he is eating. You are sitting in OPD, suppose you are getting a patient, see, just hold an object, keep an object on your table, like a like a paperweight. Ask the patient to hold how he is holding that paperweight. Ask the patient to take something to the mouth, how he is uh, bringing his hand to the mouth. So examine it that way. The, what is the his limitation? Other ideal things we you can try in the OPD also, how he is doing. If there is a gross limitation, you will find is a gross limitation. Yes, you can go for surgical procedure. And about uh, the uh, radial club hand, 
is the 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 point of focusing here is that we must have a basic knowledge on this that if you, at least we can try we can diagnose the condition we can try treat the patient in the early stages like uh, serial casting stretching this helps in subsequent cases i have seen patients even with a flexible one when there incomplete radius is there i mean proximal radius is there only distal radius is absent there they can be managed conservatively also uh, like uh, stretching and serial casting in initial stage followed by with a hand raised and forearm orthosis and the basically the aim is to uh, bring back to a neutral his position that solve your cosmetic problem and also uh, some extent if the partial radius is there they are also functionally some extents they are active so uh, if the basic knowledge is there in some cases can be managed by conservative method and the way the, the most important thing that you have to decide when to send the patient for surgery and where how long you will treat your conservative that is also uh, you have to decide at your level yeah it's a, it's a, I, i what i can summarize is uh, this zone is a very vast zone and over years with experience only we can make it out like what exactly what best can be uh, chosen for the patient i think uh, there are no more question in the chat box uh, I, i think this is time to call off for the session yeah uh, i had left only two common conditions like uh medlocks deformity of the wrist very common condition uh, and uh, this uh, deformity maybe some other time we'll discuss on that spinal shoulder also nothing must to do with the spinal shoulder but uh, yes uh, something can be done for the medlocks deformity uh, that's a congenital developmental deformity we'll discuss on some other time thank you i uh, so on behalf of uh, ipmr and svinathar i uh, congratulate and say thanks to uh, pavitra sir He has been always uh, helping us and guiding us and enlightening us at various aspects. And I also thank to all participants who have joined. And uh, uh, I am having a uh, expecting a again at uh, you be all present for the next uh, session uh, at forthcoming session. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Thank you very much. We can leave now. Yeah. Thank you.